contributions to the statistical theory of order disorder transitions. And, well, as a result of that, he was certainly aware of the simplest models that you could use, and he must have been aware of uh, pictures like this, which show the scattering uh, that you observe when, a, an, when you get a, a, an alloy which orders in a particular form. And then as you raise the temperature, the order-disorder transition, the pattern changes. Now, I'm cheating a little bit on this one because this is a, a famous picture from quasi-crystals uh, and aluminum manganese 6. Uh, aluminum 6 manganese is, a, is in fact a quasi-crystal. But I wanted to just indicate that from an early age, Professor Yang was well aware of some of these issues. And therefore, his first paper, based on his master's thesis, was published uh, in the Journal of Chemical Physics. The Journal of Chemical Physics has an interesting history because the uh, American Physical Society decided that it wasn't physics enough. And so it's a first case of uh, where people say, well, we know who we are and we know who you're not part of us. Sad, a little sad, but there we are. So this was his MSc, and uh, I want to point out one of the things that was interesting already, <coughs> namely that he was in interested in developing general methods. So there were already a number of approximate methods around, but the point is a new formulation of the quasi-chemical method, which is one of the ones there, but capable of yielding successively improved approximations. And so I think that's the issue that was uh, crucial here. Now, <coughs> we're from uh, his professor, uh, Professor Wang. In fact, he knew about the, uh, and tells in his story, uh, the excitement he registered uh, when Onsager actually solved the two-dimensional model exactly with a lot of surprising results in 1944. Uh, he then tells, Frank tells how he looked at various of these aspects and to try, and many people tried to generalize the uh, Ising model solution. I was never that tempted, but it was many years later uh, that Frank met on soccer. So this is a picture you have, but it's, uh, I thought, a rather nice one. And this was on the occasion in March 1965. And uh, so that's a, a picture that could have been posed just for it. Okay. Well, in principle, you have a copy. But, and what I might do is send you a copy of the full one, which was there were all of us uh, were there, and we were elected <laughs> Kentucky colonels. Okay. And their host, whose name I had conveniently forgotten, but uh, Frank remembered, was W.C. DeMarcus. And... Uh, Th that's the whole picture. Uh, that's DeMarcus in the middle. On Yang and Ansaga, you've seen. This is Mark Katz, who was a long-term friend. Yes, that's me. Uh, so that. <laughs> so I was going to say I was a little younger then. <laughs> uh, but that's me at the end. <laughs> So this was not the first time I had had the privilege of meeting Frank Yang. That was actually uh, when Dyson took, uh, invited me to the Institute. And uh, we were then invited to have lunch with Oppenheimer. And you were also there for the lunch with T.T. Wu as a guest. So that, I think that was the first time that I met you and that I met T.T. Wu. Uh, well, we were Kentucky colonels, and I thought you might be amused. That's one of the things that uh, they can award you in Kentucky. And, and here's the actual certificate. So this is, I'm afraid, mine. I, hopefully Yang still has his. Uh, what does this enable you to do? It enables you to go to the actual paddock during the uh, Kentucky Day races, special races. Uh, it's a horse breeding place and uh, therefore one uh, of uh, fun and games that way. So we are all awarded with a Kentucky Colonel, and for that matter, we are also awarded with uh, 
bottles of bourbon, and uh, which I don't drink, and I don't know if Frank ever drank it. But I don't want to insult you, but uh, it's relevant to hear of the Ising model. And uh, so I'll show this picture. Uh, here's a square lattice Ising model. And one of the uh, features I wanted to distinguish is this uh, particular behavior at low temperatures. And uh, low temperatures in a sense beneath the critical temperature. The crucial thing about the two-dimensional Ising model is there is a critical temperature. And if I look at the magnetization, this varies as a power to the beta. So that's the crucial thing that I wanted to see here. And of course, this is a simple model. The spins are either up or down. And that has the advantage that, of course, you can then represent this as a lattice gas. This was a sort of a well-known uh, feature. Uh, if I represent it as a lattice gas, then the density difference between the liquid and the gas becomes the analog of the magnetization. And if the magnetization for a fluid behaves in one way, and that, that for the magnet behaves in another way, well, they must in fact both have the same exponents. So we can put an equals in here. Okay, well, since you heard that already for his masters, he studied binary alloys, then there's a question of, well, let's have a look at what we would do if there was a binary alloy. The simplest binary alloy that I know is beta brass, and there's an A atom and a B atom, copper and zinc in the case of brass, and these order in a particular pattern at a very sharp temperature. And uh, in some ways, you could say the Ising model is a better model for an alloy than it is for a lattice gas or for a simple ferromagnet. And so what I've tried to indicate here is that apart from defects, there is an, a sense of an order that's building up. Here's a defect. You might say, well, if every alternate one is the order. So already that means that if you're thinking about alloys, you have to have thought about ways of characterizing the order, which has to be different than the simplest picture. And so that's the point I wanted to make, because uh, one of the things that was then intriguing is, well, how do we solve and how do we go beyond Onsager? And many people have tried that without great success. Uh, Onsager himself was interested in going beyond his calculation. And he had a habit of publishing things uh, in a, what should be said, a slightly erratic way. That is, he would go to some uh, conference and maybe announce as a footnote on someone else's work that, well, he had solved this problem. And that's how in 1949 he actually told people that he had solved this crucial problem. But it was the first publication was by Frank Yang. And uh, one of the interesting things is how he struggled to understand Hans Sarko's uh, logic. And that was not easy. But here, then, is the spontaneous magnetization. This is in 1952. And here is the comparatively simple answer. But the answer was a product of four very complicated integrals. And then miraculously, at the last step, almost these complications canceled out. And one was left with this power here. Uh, and, and the crucial fact was that beta was 1.8. Now, you might say, could we understand that 1 8? Well, I've looked at the calculation, and you can understand a half, but then you can't understand a quarter or another half squared. So these days, we think that this is part of the uh, symmetry, conformal covariance, but it was very hard to understand then. Then an obvious thing to do next is to say, well, supposing I have different interactions in the vertical direction and the horizontal direction. And I don't know C.H. Chang, but rather than uh, solve this himself, he left this problem to Chang. And there's a letter to the editor there. And what you see here, all of these are the 1-8 power.
but the race, different ratios of J1 over J2. The uh, magic is that X1 is e to the minus 2J1 over KT, so this is the, the something that vanishes at zero temperature. Similarly, X2 vanishes at zero temperature. Turns out that independently, you can write it in a very neat way, 1 minus K squared to the 1 8. There is this mysterious 1 8. And the K in this case can be done explicitly. So this is a very nice piece of work. And of course, there are thanks to Frank Yang. But I didn't know who Chang was. And uh, was he a student of yours? He was a graduate student of Boris Kaiser. Of the graduate student of Kaiser. Very good. Well, it was a very nice problem. I wish someone had given me such a nice problem uh, at an early stage. OK, so now the question is, this is all very well, uh, but might there be some actual verification of this? In other words, this is supposed to be for a two-dimensional lattice gas. Well, why might you have a, where might you find a two-dimensional lattice gas? Uh, most people think of gases as intrinsically three-dimensional. But if I condense methane onto graphite and have a submonolayer of it, then that essentially is a lattice gas. And so you might say, well, can we not verify this? And it turns out that that's not the easiest thing. The work here was done by Moses Chan and his uh, Korean graduate students. And uh, peculiarly, in the eyes of most people, he measured the specific heat. Why would he measure the specific heat? Well, you see the specific heat does something rather sharp at a, a, at a lower temperature here, but thereafter it doesn't do very much. But we know from thermodynamics that as you enter from a two-phase region to a one-phase region, there's going to be a specific heat anomaly. And so in point of fact, what I'd like to show you here is the phase diagram, which uh, was already produced, so the coverage is uh, zero is down here. This is the coverage. And here you see a fa various phases. Uh, the, if you actually deposit methane on graphite or any other, you find quite a series of phases. But here is the superfluocritical fluid. Here is essentially what we would call a liquid. Here's what we would call a vapor, a very dilute and this is the coexistence curve we would like to see. And these measurements, there were previous measurements of this, so it was known that the general behavior. But nobody had been able to do it in this clean way because they had not measured the specific heat singularities. So it was Moses Chan who investigated the uh, specific heat singularities. And here is what he found. And I, obviously, I wouldn't be showing you this unless it was pretty close to 1.8. But I think you all know that 0.127 is very close to 1.8, which is 0.125. Uh, plus or minus 2 is already at that point there. So this was in 1984. So it took a long time before one could actually do the experiment that had been forecast. So now the question is, uh, I know Moses Chan very well. He was a graduate student at Cornell. Of course, Moses is his adopted name when he came to the United States. And I'm happy to say that recently he has been revealing his Chinese name, Zhong Wai. And uh, he especially wanted to send to Frank Yang his warm wishes for an excellent health for many decades to come. <laughs> okay, so. It's Moses, and uh, he's, at Penn State. he's at Penn State, exactly. And here is his own handwriting, which I criticize as not quite up to the standards of calligraphy I would have expected. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but here is it in a little more formal. And here, for those of you who haven't seen it, is uh, Chang's, uh, Yang's name in, in full. OK, so let's move on, uh, because the next question was, one of the crucial things here, and what we're talking about, is a condensation. You can look at, if I look at this from a lattice gas, then there's a condensation. And so the 
if I actually look at the pressure versus the density, well, it remains constant. The pressure does not change as I go through the two-phase region. And this was historically a puzzle. There was a sort of a feeling that, well, maybe I should start with the one side and the liquid side and the gas side and equate their potentials. Well, that's only an approximate method. And in point of fact, uh, <coughs> one can go much better than that, do much better than that. And that's in fact exactly what was done with uh, T.D. Lee uh, in the following paper. So here's the paper, and the answer was, why don't you go into the complex plane? Okay, the moral of the story was, if you like, well, if you want to understand, and this is where the mathematics comes in, if you want to understand singular behavior, and the mathematicians knew this for some time, but the physicists certainly hadn't, then look into the complex plane and see what goes on. And uh, what goes on, of course, is that the grand canonical partition function is, and you might say, well, what complex plane should I go into? And the best complex plane is the fugacity, uh, which in terms of the chemists is the e to the chemical potential over kT. Most physicists don't have much idea of what a chemical potential is, uh, but if I think of it in the ferromagnet, it's just the uh, e to the minus 2h over kT. That's the fugacity. So if you go into this plane, then you can understand, and the grand canonical partition function is then simply uh, a partition function. It's a polynomial. And uh, in the second paper of this, uh, in the second paper, uh, they looked at the lattice gas and compared that to the Ising model. The chemists knew that these were essentially completely equivalent, and that's one of the first things. But one of the, so I look here at the grand canonical partition function. If I just have n particles, this is just a polynomial in n, and it's a polynomial in z, and therefore I can factorize it. Because it's real on the real axis, the uh, zeros have to be in the complex plane. And what was discovered was that these zeros tended to lie on a circle. And uh, one of the cr crucial things was that they were able to prove that the zeros always lie on a circle. Um, so that was a very beautiful and stimulating result. Uh, if the zeros go all the way through the axis, which is some density of zeros, and remember, we always have to take, uh, think about taking n to the thermodynamic limit. n has to be very large. Uh, in practice, you can say how large is very large, and there are answers to that which are interesting in themselves. But here's the circle theorem. So at low temperatures, there are zeros, zeros right across here, and that point then is the point of condensation. But as you arrive above, you see the zeros pull back and they only circle that way and you have a region free of zeros which is then analytic. Now you can say, well, what's good for the cat is good for the tomcat. And uh, so if there are zeros in one complex plane and if you go into one complex plane, why not go into another complex plane? And I noticed that if you look at Kaufman's solution of the Ising model, which I've given you here, uh, you might ask, what is the variable v? That would be a pressure question. And the variable v is essentially the temperature variable. It's very over two phases. So the variable that you look at there is the same. And as you see from the two circles I've enthusiastically drawn, you can check rather trivially, that the zeros lie on the two circles there. Now, what one learns from this is that the most likely organization of the zeros is on linear forms. And I don't know of any general proof of that. I don't know of any general reason why that should be the case. But it does, in fact, seem to be the case. And so uh, these density of zeros uh, now, if you look at the density of the zeros as they approach the axis, then you can read off the thermodynamic behavior. 
So in fact, you can read off from this solution of the two-dimensional Ising model that the two to the two diverges logarithmic, which of course was the famous Onsager result. So that's a way of uh, uh, seeing what goes on, uh, both in the temperature plane as well as in the uh, activity or other planes. Well, I would like to carry this a little further because I have a color picture now that shows you what happens um, if you think of this in a broader sense. So supposing we say, let's look at the angle of zeros, and let's notice then that the roof of critical temperature here. Well, this is a plane of zeros, so what I've colored yellow here is density of zero. And if I have a particular zero back here, well, it's going to increase in temperature. At the critical point, it's just where a gap opens up in zero. Uh, if you translate the circle theorem into uh, the theorem in the magnetic field, it essentially says, well, the zeros all lie on the imaginary axis. So here you have the imaginary axis, and the zeros lie there. The real axis, as soon as you leave the imaginary axis or the imaginary plane, is free. And it's a plane because I've looked at temperature. So now here you see an edge. Okay. Uh, what's that edge? Well, I call it the Yang Li edge uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but now it was pointed out by uh, Bob Griffiths uh, that, well, it would be interesting to know what is the density of the zeros along that that Yang Li edge. Uh, is it constant? Does it vary? What should be going on? And so we can specify that a little more formally here. Uh, the density of the zeros I can define. And as soon as you define something like that, you have to say, well, probably there's an exponent. There's always the possibility for logarithm, but uh, we know how to look after that. So let's say the Yang Li zeros are characterized by an exponent sigma. Uh, and that being so, then we can ask about some of the other exponents that we do. And one can now start saying, well, let's have a look at the exact behavior. If I go down to one dimension, and this is essentially a trivial problem, and I find that the singularity is a half. So the, uh, the density of the zeros vanishing on the Yang Li edge, uh, but with a no, it's here minus a half, I beg your pardon. If I want to go up to six dimensions, so this already has a different borderline dimension than the normal critical exponents I spoke about on Monday. Here, the borderline dimension is six. And so I can do an epsilon expansion starting from six, and it's a half minus one twelfth epsilon and so on. So in fact, there's a singularity here, which one can analyze by the standard methods, and for which, in fact, scaling behavior uh, works out fairly well. Uh, just to convince you of that, let me show you uh, one picture where, when one has looked at this exponent sigma, this is the leading exponent, as a function of the dimensionality. So the dimensionality here is one, so that's trivial. Here is six. From there on, it's fixed at a half. And these are estimates and the simple uh, expansion from six minus epsilon degrees made to go through here. As you see, it fits very well. One could go a little further, actually, and look at the correction exponent. I won't bore you with that. But when one looks at the ex experiments, one has to say, well, the exponent I'm looking at is only asymptotic, and therefore there will be corrections. And these may be quite singular than themselves. So it turns out to be important to understand the singularity. Now, the question then becomes, so what is the nature of this singularity? And, well, it's out in a complex plane, so it's not all that surprising that if I look so let me uh, call the order parameter psi. If I'm doing a normal uh, Landau-Ginsberg approximation, I'll say, well, psi squared and psi fourth are the crucial things. What turns out here 
is that I need an I, I need a parameter, and then I need a Q. So in fact, the Yangli edge is described by a cubic singularity. And uh, that one can then go on and say, yes, but are there any other cases where it shows up a little more realistically uh, in other contexts? And the answer is yes. So here's a, a model, which is fun to think about. Uh, this, what I can do, is people are desperately trying to find a soluble model. And Gaussian integrals are well known, so we can do a Gaussian integral. And therefore I can think about a repulsive uh, core, and I can think of approximating that by that. If you want to do it the right way, then you do it by saying, well, let me take the Maya function, and let me take the Maya function uh, in that appropriate way, and write the Maya function under the Gaussian. Then you find, if I say, well, I've got two types of molecules, A's and B's, and the A's and B's don't interact except for this hardcore repulsion, but an A with an A and or a B with a B is free, then you find there's a critical point. And I won't bore you, but that's the critical point, and it obeys all the usual rules. But then you find, if you look in the complex plane, this is the ZA, ZB real plane of both of them, that then there's a perfectly real line here, which is the singularity of the repulsive potential. And this is determined by the I cube, and so this is the same singularity as occurs at a Yangli edge. So that's uh, some of the fun and games you can have as you travel this a little further. Uh, there I merely put down the, some of the things that are important. And I can show you explicitly here. So you can say, well, this is the pressure near the uh, singular line, near the repulsive singular line, and here's the correction experiment. And these correction experiments turn out to be pretty important if you want to understand experimental data. And although there are not too many experimentalists have spoken at this meeting, uh, we all know that ultimately what we do in theory is uh, validated by if it works in experiments. So let me uh, pass on to the next issue. Now the next issue is in 1947, in 57, so earlier on, and uh, Kirsten Huang was not here, and uh, so we, uh, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting him again. I do know him and I have met him at other times. Uh, but he uh, joined forces with uh, Frank Yang and they looked at the quantum many-body problem. And this is obviously a crucial problem and an important problem. Um, I never followed this myself very much, so you see a whole series of papers here. Uh, but I was especially struck by this equation here. This equation here was for a finite pose gas of n particles in an L cubed box, three-dimensional box. And if you look at the commentary, then you'll see, well, there's a problem with this equation. Because I want to, as I emphasized before, I always have to take the thermodynamic limit. Well, here, there's an N over an L cubed. That works out fine. That's just the density. But here, there's an N over an L squared. And as I take the limit to the thermodynamic limit of constant density, that's going to diverge. And so the story is told about they held up some time on that. And then there are a series of other papers. So there was a large effort, for which I am guilty of not having paid serious attention, uh, of about 16 papers over a course of about five or six years. Uh, and down here is the uh, many-body problem in uh, statistical mechanics, volume uh, part one, and this around the six sections. Uh, there was a hope that one might see what happened at the point of where, after all this is helium, this is going to be a superfluid, 
there's going to be a superfluid to a normal fluid transition, and you might hope from this analysis that you could get the behavior. We know now that this didn't work, and we know now that it really shouldn't have worked. There was no way of doing it. But now I'd like to change uh, tune a little bit and say, well, one of the important things, from my point of view, what science is about is understanding. And you verify your understanding by doing an experiment. But understanding varies from person to person, but we usually understand the concept if we can give it a good name. And so I want to tell you the story of Bose-Einstein condensation. Now, of course, originally it was naive and it was an ideal Bose-Einstein condensate. You could work out the single particle spectrum uh, as n became large. You could see what happened. Um, and then you discovered that there was, in fact, a transition. Okay. And uh, the occupation of the lowest state became macroscopic beneath a certain critical temperature, uh, which was natural to uh, identify as a lambda point, and there was a three halves power here. But one knew that this was the ideal, and the question was, what should one do beyond that? And what is this N zero anyway? It can't be the occupation of the ground state, that's fine for a Bose-Einstein condensate, but it can't be the actual transition that takes place in reality. So it turns out that I, first of all, learnt about this uh, when I came out from the military. I did uh, some military service after my first degree. Uh, that set me back, so I felt, for a couple of years. But in 1952-3, I was sent up to Cambridge and I spoke to Oliver Penrose, whom I knew. Uh, I have to say Oliver, not versus Roger Penrose, because Roger is more flamboyant, a younger brother. Uh, this is Oliver Penrose, the very serious senior brother. And he explained to me uh, his ideas on what was going on for N0. A few years later, he went to work with Onsaga and it was one of those interesting and fairly rare cases where you have a postdoc come to work with you and what their thoughts are are so exciting that you say, well, we want to work with that. And so Onsager and Penrose wrote a paper in 56, but they never developed the name. And the question is, what is the form of order? And off-diagonal long-range order was in fact what the contribution of Yang was, and analyzing this a little more thoroughly. So let me uh, explain to you what the issues are. The issue is that we know there's, of course, a wave function. The wave function is there. But we can integrate out all the coordinates, except we can look off diagonal. And we can say, well, let's look at psi dagger at r, but psi here at r prime. And the suggestion was, originating from Penrose, that as you go to the separation on the single particle density for an Onsaga, for a uh, boson, that's the indication. And that then, if you look at that, that will have a, a phase and an amplitude and the amplitude will be essentially the condensate, the analog of what happens in an ideal gas, and there's a phase and an amplitude, and there will be an exponent beta. And this is quite analogous to looking at the spin-spin correlation function for a ferromagnet and saying that as the two spins become far apart, each one essentially looks like a spontaneous magnetization. So this was the analogy. But it was not well appreciated. And along comes our hero today. And this is published, notice, in the reviews of modern physics. So it was a review, but an, and a review of tremendous clarification. And this was the way the term off-diagonal long-range order was introduced. It's often very important in our understanding to have a clear and appropriate name. 
Yang's parameter would not be good enough. Off diagonal long range order was a wonderful term. There was also then an analysis here of the quantum phases of liquid helium from which it came, but it was pointed out that this was superconductors. And if you look at the references, reference one was to Penrose's work in 1951. Reference two was to Penrose and Onsaga in 56. There was no attempt to take precedence and credit for this insight. Nevertheless, it is a huge insight and enables one to go and think in other things. London, Sherlock, these are all later dates. And so that's what I want to point out, that often you can contribute usefully and effectively by simply uh, <coughs> having a good, clear concept and a good name that goes with it. Now, I'd like to finish up on one other paper. And uh, I've never had the privilege of meeting your brother, Chen Ping Yang. Uh, he was eight years younger, if I recall. And uh, this is a paper by Yang and Yang. Uh, it was a FizRev letter, as you see, in 1964. And it's the critical point of a liquid in a gas. And it starts off, on the one hand, by saying, well, uh, we became aware of the fact, and I knew them personally, so Voronel had looked at argon and the specific heat of argon. Uh, and that's clearly singular, okay? If you'd like to say, well, what should alpha have been? It should have been about 0 0.1, 0 0.11. They, their data were not sufficiently accurate. But it was clear that there was a singularity at the critical point of argon. And then the question is, so what? Well, we uh, expect singular points once we've seen what happens with the superfluid helium. So it's interesting to know the value and if you're interested in the values. But it was pointed out in this paper, here's the crucial equation. Now you probably can't read that and so I'm going to enlarge it up. This was just standard thermodynamics. The only difference was it wasn't in any of the thermodynamic books as far as I knew. And the question was, if the specific heat at constant volume diverges, what does that entail? And here's the uh, summary. So what I've shown you here is that we know that the specific heat at constant volume for the whole system will diverge with an exponent of about 0.1. But the specific heat, and this is the thermodynamics that was pointed out, that depends on the second derivative of the pressure and on the second derivative of the chemical potential. And if I am looking at the two-phase region, this is a perfectly valid equation in the two-phase region. And so the question was raised, well, why should it only occur in the one variable? And if I look at any of the simple models, and they were more or less taken for granted. So if I look at the Ising model, then mu doesn't diverge at all. And therefore, everything is here. Is that really true? Why should it be the case? Isn't that a little too simple? And the answer is, yes, it is a little too simple. And I've indicated some indications here. I'd like to put it a little more dramatically by saying, well, here is the question uh, in terms of the phase diagram. You can either look at mu versus T on the two-phase region, so it's well-defined, or you can look at uh, the pressure versus the temperature, which is the way one normally does. But if you think there's a CV, then you better have a divergent curvature at the end here. Well, why not have a divergent curvature in mu? Why not in D? Uh, well, the simple models don't have it. Well, so what? Who should believe? Why should we believe the simple model? So I'd like to take the la last few minutes just very briefly indicating that that has profound problems and profound implications. So the full thermodynamics is actually best dealt with 
if I look at the great grand partition function, that's just some relation between p mu and t. If I look at the deviations from criticality here and make the small deviations, well, uh, then scaling says basically I just need a p tilde and a mu tilde, and I'll talk about what those are, and divided by t tilde to a, a suitable power, divided by t tilde to a suitable power. So this is the consequence of the scaling. This is the simplest way of envisaging scaling. And it, once you follow that through, you see all the exponents. So now here, then we already know that the pressure has to be, in general, there have to be quadratic terms here, I'm missing them out. But here is what we already knew. But we, we knew that there had to be a bit more than that. And uh, so what was already established and my colleague at Cornell, um, David Merman, had played a role in this, was that there has to be at least another term mixing in here, the chemical potential, uh, into the temperature. And that has consequences that in the uh, diameter, the coexistence curve diameter, I will see an extra singularity. But if I take seriously the consequences of the that to follow from arguing what should happen uh, more generally, then, so I'm now simply saying, well, let me answer the question that Yang and Yang posed. And that, the only way you can get a contribution here, and this is where you have to look up, this is the contribution which, when differentiated twice, will give you a contribution the mu, this is the contribution that we already knew, the d is an extra one, and what you learn from this is that it has to mix in there. And you can say, well, what is the final consequence of all that? Let me give you a, a bit of a sense. It's amusing to know that the um, specific heat contribution does not have to be positive. So here's a picture I would like to uh, bring close to the end. Uh, here you see one of the specific heat divergences. Here you see the contribution from the P of sigma. But down here at the bottom, you see the contribution from the mu. So this is the piece that Yang and Yang said, well, don't forget. And it's there enough. This is a simple model that is put there in reality. And the interesting thing is it can be negative. So I think in this case, you see up here the yang-yang ratio, uh, which is how much is determined by the mu dependence, how much of that, and uh, Cp plus C mu are down here together. It can be negative. Not surprising. And there's nothing in the thermodynamics that says it can't. So this is the way I would like you to think of the importance of simple questions and simple statements. Uh, I would like to finally finish up with a picture that connects us to quantum field theory. Statistical mechanics, as we know, has been connected to quantum field theory. And the way I like to think of it is that there's a lot of energy been focused on high energy physics. And in many ways, this is justifiable because we can say, well, as we want to understand the fundamental particles, we need to go lower and lower. Uh, but that tended to be somewhat on an island. And out here, there's a beautiful landscape, which I've called the land of statistical physics. And uh, my colleague, Ken Wilson, and for sure, Yang, have been concerned with building a bridge uh, across this pool of ignorance, as I've labeled it here. And I've made some of the comparisons down here. So it's on that note that I would like to say one of the advantages of working in the land of specific heat is that if you have an interesting theory, then you can, and you have good friends amongst the experimentalists, they may be able to make something that matches your theory even if it's not there otherwise. And I've done this on a number of occasions. 
And in some sense, the two-dimensional model is of that character. There have been other cases where I've been able to do it. So I would like to say it's uh, very fitting and it's a great pleasure to be able to celebrate this occasion, the 60 years of Yang Mills. But the way I look at it is how simple but basic ideas and concepts can sprout and add to our understanding in a very deep way. Thank you, Frank. You don't have to. I was just uh, wondering for historical curiosity what, uh, what the context was in which you uh, wrote to uh, Yang when you first wrote to Yang. So could you give us a little bit more historical context? You were a student. Was why did I write to Yang uh, asking about the perceptibility? Uh, and the question was, you know, if you were interested in physical phenomena, then a uh, spontaneous magnetization Form. But you can only see that when you when anybody would deal with the term magnet, the perceptibility is getting larger and larger as I approach it. So I had the fortunate that Cyril John, who was also trained in mathematics, uh, had developed a, a way of looking at singularity that said, well, if there's a singularity, it has to show up in the power series. Now, the mathematicians knew this, but it could also always show up in all the, 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 the ubiquitous term orders. That isn't the way nature works. So we were studying the susceptibility, and I had an argument based, in fact, on a one Onsolver result, namely they, one of the things that Onsolver did was to work out what the correlation function would do at the physical point. And he found that this would decay very slowly. To my somewhat amazement, he just said, well, it would decay slowly. But he gave a formula. And so I was great enough to work out, I like using the answers, what the power law was. And it was a one upon r to the one quarter. And by putting together one upon r to the one quarter with some of the other things that on brother had determined, I was able to conclude that the conceptibility equals this was a surprise to one side and my book was surprised to one side. But knowing that Yang had found this calculation to be that, it was uh, impossible to write and say, well, have you looked at this possibility? Uh, it made it too hard. They did not. And they had looked at it, found it too hard, and it was too light enough. So they had heard of it. Thank you very much.